one of the main talking points on this other person's show with the major guest is somebody that Jen would like to speak to regarding the state of Israel yes. and how uh, how the, the Zionist perspective about why uh, it is justified that Israel conducts business on behalf of the Jewish people that they do, when in reality what they're doing is making things exceptionally worse, especially from an anti-Semitic perspective. Yeah, my thoughts are, well, it's interesting. Like I, I'm watching like somebody like our representative basically call him out as anti-Semitic, which is absurd. Okay, RFK Jr. is not an anti-Semite. I not even a little think that. However, she yet is the biggest Zionist that I that, that we have down here, basically. And she is calling him an anti-Semite. And yet I'm finding what, what bothers me about him is the level of Zionism that he seems to be like promoting. <laughs> um, and so I would really very much like to talk with him about this. I think he really needs to speak with some of the Jews in Jewish Voice for Peace, whether it's me or some of the people that are actually in charge of Jewish Voice for Peace. But I feel like he is someone that might be receptive to education and reason. I would love to connect him with Rabbi Brant Rosen, who we have had on our show. There are numerous, numerous educated people um, it, within the Jewish community that would be very happy to speak with him about this. And it bothers me that he is going with basically talking points that are directed um, by non-Jewish people, whether it's this administration or where I just, it bothers me. I think, I think he needs to be educated on this. And so I'm offering an opportunity to discuss this with him. This is also one of the biggest problems with Wasserman Schultz uh, calling RFK an anti-Semite, as is often the case in many instances when somebody is mm -hmm. called an anti-Semite, is they want to over-exaggerate how much they love Israel to prove that they're not an anti-Semite. Well, actually, if you don't kowtow to the mm. Israeli lobby, you're actually showing how much you do love the Jewish people. The Israeli lobby is well aware of the hatred that is directed at the Jewish people as a result of their belief, because that's all it is, it's a belief, that they are the chosen people and that they are better than everybody else. And so by that extension of we can land grab all we want simply because we are a democracy in the Middle East, that is a justification right. for this, you know, again. But to me, when I hear him talking like the way he's been talking to me, and even this administration, quite honestly, I don't see them addressing the Trump move of the embassy to Jerusalem. I don't see them really. So really, they're all on the same page. That's what this says to me. They're all on the same page. And by the way, there is absolutely no way at this point for there to ever be a two-state solution. So anybody who's in the Democratic Party that has that either on their policy platform or whatever it is, they're blowing smoke up your ass. That's not possible. That can't happen. We are so far past that at this point. Yeah, we're not getting to a point where you could have a two-state solution considering no. all of the... It, it's much like the two-party system. If you a two-state solution, how long do you think it would take before the two states were at war with each other. That's not the bigger issue. The bigger issue is, is that Israel has made it impossible to create two states because of their illegal occupation of the West Bank and other such things and their complete violation of international law, so on. And so the way it is set up right now, the way that the territory is set up, there is no viable way to create two states, which is exactly why Israel did what they did in where they occupied. They created a checkerboard situation so that it can never be a state. That was the point of what they did. And we funded it and we're still funding it. And we just sit there and watch it and then call anybody who speaks out against an anti-Semitic. That's just not, I'm, I'm done with that. Again, newsflash for the people. And I'll say it till I'm blue in the face. Judaism and Zionism are two completely different things, completely different things. Judaism was around long before Zionism, and it'll be around long after. And quite honestly, that's where we need to be moving. Uh, Zionism is white supremacy. We're obviously going to make a clip of this so that the RFK people can hear about this. But can you please share exactly why there, what, this, this whole movement 
preceded World War II and the Holocaust. Oh, yes. And how the Holocaust was used mm -hmm. as a political tool mm -hmm. to for the Zionist movement to get exactly what they wanted. Yeah, I mean, for sure it was. And I actually think it's even more nefarious than that. I actually believe that there is a connection to between the U.S. rejecting boatloads of Jewish um, uh, immigrants that were trying to escape yes. refugees. Oh, yes. I think there is a very strong connection with our rejecting them in cahoots with the Zionists in the Western European Zionists. And make no mistake, the Zionism movement is a white European settler colonialism movement. It is not about Jews. They use the Jews to do what they're trying to do. And that is what I feel infuriated about as a Jew that feels like I was used in promoting their agenda. And um, the, the way I know this is if you look at how in Israel, non-white Jews are treated. If you look at how Palestinian Jews, and here is something that is a newsflash for people. Yes, there are Palestinian Jews. Guess what? There were Jews that were living in the area long before there was the state of Israel. There were Jews, there were Christians, and there were Muslims. There were probably other people too, but let's just focus on the big three. Everyone was fine. There wasn't any issues. They were all Palestinian. Everybody had their little tribes. Everybody was doing their thing until the white the white Euro Jews decided that they need this to expand their settler colonialism territory. And then once the Holocaust happened, they played on that, they played on those fears and they used it. And I do believe in conjunction with the United States and other allied forces to be able to finally create the Zionist state of Israel. It had been started in the late 1800s. Um, no, maybe early 1800s. And it comes from, is it Hungary, Germany? And it was from Theodor Herzl. He is the name of the Jewish, the European Jew. And it has always been their thing to have like this settled land that they somehow feel entitled to. And um, the Jews that were there, the Palestinian Jews, were just as discarded as the Muslim Palestinians and the Christian Palestinians. See, that's how you know it's not about Jews. It's not about Jews. Now they'll go to places like Ethiopia and they'll import the Jews under the guise of we're saving them. We're rehoming them to the promised land. We're saving them. Yeah, you're saving them to go to Israel and be second class citizens just so that you can have enough numbers of Jewish population to maintain a majority and suppress the Palestinians. So it, it's not about Jews. APAC has said repeatedly, we are not about Jewish um, Judaism. We are about Zionism. And that is the truth. They are different things. And one of the reasons why it was important to have Professor Hickey on this evening to talk about one of the forgotten periods in our nation's history, the War of 1812, is also the forgotten history of the of World War II. And that, of course, is for several years, years, the Nazis were trying to just get the Jews out of Europe. And the United States refused to accept them. And so ultimately, the final solution, which was crafted in the winter of 1942, after the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, and the mm -hmm. Nazis knew that there was only going to be so much more time that they would have as some type of a reigning empire. Because remember, there were two things that happened in the winter of 1942 that changed the entire outlook of the history of, this, of, of the world, quite frankly. You had the Japanese bombing Pearl Harbor at the same time that the Nazis were trying to invade Russia and got stopped about 10 miles from Moscow. And as a result, the war changed in a matter of months. Whereas if you look at what the world map looked like two years into World War II, it did look like the Nazis were going to take over the world. But in terms of what ultimately happened, the acceleration of the final solution, the three or four million, no, four or five million Jews that ultimately were murdered in the span of about three years, this could have been avoided, I don't know how significantly, but probably to a great degree, if the United States was willing to accept some type of a refugee program for Jews in this country, because what would have happened as a result is other nations would have followed suit. The United States may not have been the global dominant superpower it became as a result of World War II. However, they were still one of the three or four leading nations in the world at that time. And by their decision to say, F them, they're not coming in here. They literally sent, that, sent back the votes. So the decision to 
just exterminate them didn't happen immediately. It was something that ultimately they decided, well, we don't want them. We don't want to deal with them. They will not be a part of the <laughs> thousand years of the diamond of Europe, you know, fantasy that the Nazis were selling to their people and to parts of Europe. Instead, what they did was give them an opportunity to get lost. And when that didn't happen, they decided, well, we're not going to live with you. So I guess we're just going to have to kill you. So it's not like it, there wasn't something that led to it. This perception, this historical recreation of the Nazis just wanted to eliminate the Jews and the benevolent Americans had to come in and save them. It's not true. We well, no, 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 the Nazis did want to eliminate the Jews. Sure. They, they didn't they care how. They didn't care one way or the other how. They were yeah. going to do it either way. They were genocidal. Now, whether or not they did it from letting them leave versus exterminating them, that was sort of played out in different ways. And it happened over a period of time. And there are different, lots of different stories in that. But the point is, mm, the United States wasn't, wasn't offering up any help. No, and again, this is the big problem when people start talking about the Palestinian people and the... the RFK was talking about <clears throat> how there's, um, I guess it has to do with Hamas, and mm -hmm. there, uh, it isn't a, I, I forget what the specific term is, if you martyr yourself um, in, in their culture, uh, pertaining to, you know, like what happened on 9-11 and things like that. Right. But what they're really talking about is, if you kill a Jew, uh, you're like paid handsomely or something like that. Mm. It, you don't think that all of that exists like all but over see, the world? But see, here's something that I find very interesting, and this is from talking to people that I know that are Palestinian. I actually have a friend here who's Palestinian who still has family um, there. I know a few people, and here's the thing. They don't hate Jews. They hate the state of Israel. And quite honestly, I don't blame them. That's who's making it so they get electricity maybe a little bit here and there. They don't get fresh water. They don't get to travel on highways. They can't go and come as they please. They're being completely policed and patrolled. And it's like, so if you're going to now say that they hate Jews because they hate their oppressor, well, you're again conflating the state of Israel with Jews. And unfortunately, that seems to be something we do here more. I do not find that Palestinians have an issue with Jewish people. I don't find that at all. I find that Palestinians have an, is, an issue with their oppressor. Our resident conservative friend, Metalopoli, wants to know what is the Talmud and what does it teach? Is it true that they think of the Goy as cattle? Okay, I'm not going to respond to the Goy's cattle. Goy is definitely derogatory, and I'm going to give you exactly the definition. The Talmud is the book, so let's hold on. Jen's got some. Hold on, hold on, hold about. on. Okay. Sure, so, yeah. okay. So the thing about the Talmud is, is it isn't like the Bible or the Torah where it is some like chronology of events. The Talmud is actually a compilation of ancient teachings regarded as the sacred and normative by Jews from the time it was regarded, compiled until modern times. It's really about, it is fables. I think it is a lot of morality. It's teachings, and but it is a compilation of teachings. I don't know if that quite explains it, but it isn't like a, a, a story, like a history story. Primary source of religious, Jewish religious law and Jewish theology. So it's definitely based on the Torah, which is the Torah is the five books of Moses. Um, that is basically what we're talking about when we say the Old Testament. Um, I would say the Talmud is based on Torah and the teachings, uh, but it also has things from later on. Like there's things in the Talmud that aren't that ancient. There are things in the Talmud that were added by um, rabbis and, and people later on that sort of like, I guess, further define Jewish laws. Uh, there's a lot of them. I really am not that interested in, in, in reading the whole thing, but yeah. That's what the Talmud is. And, and yeah, Goy is derogatory. I generally say, I always say Gentile. I always say Gentile. And people think that's strange that I say Gentile, but it's just so much easier and non-offensive. So that's what I say. Because the Bible, the Bible says Gentile. Well, the Bible is literal, so you better follow it. Well, I just say, and, and as somebody who grew up Jewish to us growing up, and again, I am much more aware now, but it was, there were Jews and there were Gentiles. 
that was it. It wasn't like I made the delineation between Protestants, Catholic, Catholics, and and different Muslims and all that stuff. It wasn't Jen, like Jen, that. you don't know what you're talking about. You have to make the difference between each and every segment of the population that well, is not Jewish. Right. If the Jews are the chosen people, the then everybody else is a non-Jew. And well, that's all there is. I, I'm just saying, and and you know, I definitely grew up in a family that did use the term. Uh, uh, you know, there are lots of terms that we use. We're allowed to use them. We are Jews. We are allowed to get away with them. We are not There's a lot of derogatory terms. They're not derogatory. Yeah, they are. They're just derogatory. Stop it. We are simply explaining the He's truth. He's trying to be Ben Shapiro. We are, we are just, excuse me, I'm talking right now. And when you interrupt me when I'm talking, it's not a good thing. Oh By the way, don't see the Barbie movie. It's really terrible. And it's totally. I'm not man. liking your Ben Shapiro. You My Ben Shapiro is really good. No. So anyway, uh, the Jewish people are the chosen people. They are perfect people. And everybody else sucks. So just remember that. And well, yeah, whatever, because I, I and I'm totally masculine. I can please my wife, and I can do all of these wonderful. Yeah, things. That's trust me. Is. Believe me. It's so, terrible. like my my thought on it is <laughs> that I can simultaneously be proud about being Jewish because I am. I think it is really cool. I think it is cool to be sort of part of uh, a history and a minority that has been through as much persecution and as much crap and has done so well. And I do feel proud about that. And I and I and by the way, my family. We're not the privileged Jews. Like my family, we're not those people. I'm the first person in my family that went to college. My family were all working class people. My dad grew up in in like a two bedroom, but, one bath but, house with like seven people in Miami. But I think that's true of anybody because as we've often said on this show, this is a class war. Everything becomes a class war. Well, I just think oftentimes people somehow associate Jews with somehow wealth. And I just, I and, and I do realize that now we do see that. We do see that now. But what I'm saying is, is that many of us were not raised that way. Well, the, and again, I don't know how true it is for all parts of the United mm -hmm. States. I don't know how it is in Los Angeles in particular, which has the third highest Jewish population outside of That's Brooklyn. That's where Jason grew up. Well, outside of Brooklyn and outside of South Florida, Miami specifically, the biggest Jewish population in the country is in Los Angeles. And what I would be more curious to know is if it really just comes down to class, which in many ways, Zionism has a class construct in a lot of ways. Affluent Jewish people tend to be much more Zionistic than working class Jewish people tend to be. And I don't know if that's just reflective on territory or not. Yeah, but I'm not sure. It also has to do with, there's also like this, this geographic thing as to how influenced um, a lot of people were by the Zionist movement and how effective it was back in the day when my grandmother and all them were basically being indoctrinated and then passed it on to us and how effective that was. And it obviously was much more intense in very, very, I mean, I grew up in an extremely uh, monoculture Jewish community. I grew up, everybody was Jewish where I grew up. Like we, honestly. Oh, it, Jay, Ray J, did you have to go there? Jen, will you tile the bathroom? I don't know if that's like a, a stereotype of some kind. I, I don't know what that means. What does that mean? I don't know, but I'm beginning to think that Ray J must be one of Jason's friends no, that's Ray, wanting me to. No, Ray J's, uh, Ray J's friend of um, Dem uh, uh, Stuck in the Middle, I think, of uh, Osiris. I don't know. Well, how do you know about the bathroom? What like, does that have to do with the Like, top? I'm having issues in the bathroom, but how would somebody know I'm having issues in the bathroom? I no, I don't want to tile the bathroom. Well, I tile the bathroom. I mean. Rob, good to see you. Uh, Listen, uh, the big difference between Cornell West and RFK is simply this. One has money and an infrastructure right now, and the other doesn't. So, But is Cornell playing the win? He's playing for the movement. He's in it for the right reasons. If he can get 5%, that's a huge deal for people that are wanting, that, wanting third party to get federal funding. So do I think that he can rally a movement? Do I think he can push the needle? Do I think he could get people engaged and that it could really help down ballots and help pursue ballot initiatives and all sorts of stuff? Yeah, I think he's capable of firing up the people. And I think it's very important to support him. I don't care if you live, what state you live in. I really don't. I don't care if it's a, if it's a, you know, a, you know, when you're living in, what, are, what do they call us now? We're now, we're, we're not purple, we're red now. But when I used to be in a swing state, I mean, it's, it's like, I'm not going to be swayed by those kinds of strategies anymore. I support Cornel West because I support Cornel West. He stands for everything that I believe in basically, and is coming at this from all the same reasons that I'm in this. So why, how could I support anybody else? I think that's a great point. And the other thing we also have to remember regarding the primary process, and this is something that RFK did talk about this evening. Uh, I, I have been saying, 
I, it doesn't matter that the Democratic establishment, the DNC, is not going to be holding any debates. That's just the tip of the iceberg. They're literally rigging the election. So what have they decided they're now going to do? Well, funny you should ask. They're going to put South Carolina first. Well, then New Hampshire's not having it, though. Oh, no, that's not it. It's, oh, okay. it's, it's even worse. Okay. So apparently now, because it looks like RFK is almost assuredly going to win both Iowa and New Hampshire, the Democratic establishment is now planning to remove President Biden from the from the ballot in both states. And by doing that, they are declaring it as a non-starter and the delegates from those states will not count at the convention. How is that? How is that? So allowed? don't ever say. Wait a minute. How how are our friends in Iowa standing for that? I wouldn't stand for it. The, the, both states Iowa, are going to go red. Well, both but New Hampshire, red. New Hampshire so, has already said they're having their primary, whether we like it or not. Um, it's in their constitution to do so. But we have had a lot of people on this show from Iowa. Iowa politics is loud and proud, and they are working and farm people. And I cannot believe that they're going to sit by and allow this to happen. You know, everyone talks about how this country is going towards fascism and that we are completely losing our democracy. Our democracy has been lost. Are you talking about India Walton? Our democracy was lost a long time ago. And so now when you really start to peel back the mask and realize that there's no there there, there was never going to be a fair electoral process. Now it's just shoved in your face because there is a sitting president who is a, there is an attempted primary against. And what the Democratic Party is ultimately going to show as the days and weeks and months go by is that everything that they say is a reflection of what is the complete opposite of what they're doing. They claim that the Republicans are about suppressing democracy. No. They're well, yes, 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 that's true too. Both things can be true is my point. But the Democrats are about eliminating democracy altogether. <laughs> no, they like it unless it affects their little position. They like democracy for, for other things, but not for in-house. In-house, we decide. We decide what we're going to do. Thanks for watching. If you want to support our mission to transform politics into service, please like this video, subscribe, follow us on social media, and consider joining our Patreon, where you'll get early access to our interviews as well as other exclusive content. Links are in the description. Peace out.